Again, uh, welcome to session 10. This is the last session in this action research uh, course for this autumn. So that you know, and I, I know that you are pretty aware of the fact that we will be offering this again in the spring. So if you, uh, if you could, if, if this is something that you would recommend to colleagues uh, in the springtime, it doesn't begin until the end of February, and then it will be on Wednesdays in the spring rather than on Tuesday afternoons. And we did that just to make it a little bit easier uh, for people who might find conflicts on Tuesdays. I know that some of our schools, two of our schools have their staff meetings on Tuesdays. So uh, the, the ones in the spring will be on Wednesdays. Uh, today, we have everyone except Georgette. She didn't pre-register for the session, so we're not expecting her to join us. Chris had pre-registered, so um, I expect that Chris is probably gonna sign on sometime during uh, the, the first part of the, this introduction to today. So in session 10 today, we're gonna talk about sharing research findings. And again, this is based on the uh, assumption that, that uh, or, or the, the supposition that at some point when you do a, an actual research project, you're gonna have uh, findings and results that are worth sharing with other people. And again, this is kind of a, a final step. It's a summative step in an action research cycle. And, and I say summative a, a little bit tentatively because we've talked about the fact that action research, action research runs in cycles. And even though you may create a final project report, a very important part of that report are the questions, the new questions that arise from the first cycle of action research. So again, today we're gonna to talk just a little bit about how to document and share what you learned and how to plan for future action research cycles. And so our question today that is kind of guiding what we do is what do you, what's next? What do you do when, once you've completed your action research project? To start today's session, I'm just going to talk about the headings or the sections that you would typically find in an action research report. And the headings that I'm going to be talking about are some of the same headings that you will have used in Learning Log 10.1. And so the first heading that, that is, is really rather typical in any action research report is the introduction. The kinds of things that you would address in the introduction, you would talk about what the focus of your study was, you would describe the basis of your interest in the topic or that focus. You would explain what you were trying to learn about or understand, in other words, what your overall goals were in having undertaken the research projects. You might talk about uh, a little bit of your own history and experience in teaching or in that aspect of the practice that you're investigating through the action research piece. And in the introduction, you would also state your research question. So again, all of those things come in the very front part of the action research report. What tends to follow is the literature review and literature reviews can be formal and they can be informal. And, and again, in the preparation that you did today with Learning Log 10.1, the literature review was presented in a slightly less formal way than it might be in other published literature review reports. So within the literature review, again, you're, you're trying to address several important questions. Uh, to begin with, and most importantly, what's the background of the topic or the focus that you're investigating? Um, what, what about that is important for other people to understand? Uh, to what context, uh, or what, what, what is the context that previous work has taken place in? So if there are other projects uh, or research pieces that are similar to yours, what was the context that they took place in? Um, an, an important purpose of the literature review is to situate your own research within the related professional literature. And so you're going to be looking at things, you may be looking at things that are kind of uh, well established in the academic research. They may be big educational theories or models. Uh, you may be uh, kind of situating your particular piece of research in something in, in an area of practice that is newer or has a lot of emerging piece of uh, emerging research. And again, in the literature review, you are, uh, you know, you do this by first consulting the professional literature by organizing that information, typically by themes, and then analyzing and summarizing and synthesizing uh, the background information, not necessarily providing written descriptions of all of the things that have come before. The next section is the method section. And this section, again, addresses a whole series of questions. Uh, things like where was the study conducted and where was the data gathered? What was the specific context? So what is the teaching context? Who are the children in the classroom? 
Um, what grade level is it? What subjects were you addressing in the research project? What were their different, uh, what kind of stage of development were the students at with whatever the thing is that you were researching? Um, how did you create the context within your classroom for conducting that piece of research? Were there some specific interventions or teaching strategies that you used with students? And of course, who were the participants? Who were the students? How did you select them? What's your relationship with them? Are you their main teacher? Are you a specialist teacher? Uh, did you need to get permission from anyone in order to conduct that piece of research? And again, uh, the, the criteria for that generally is that you want to be certain that there are uh, that uh, your head of school is informed that you're doing a piece of research like this. Sometimes it might be appropriate to inform parents, especially if you're going to be involving parents in the data collection or you're going to be submitting or sending home questionnaires or surveys for parents to answer about things that might be happening in class. Um, and again, when you think about gaining permission or informed consent, one of the things you're, you're really trying to ensure is that as a, as a result of conducting your research, that no particular group or no particular part of your class uh, is disadvantaged or harmed in any way uh, as a result of the research project. So you're not providing an enhanced service for just a small number of students in your class at the expense of other students. Um, also in the method methods, you, you wanna talk about the actual research design that you used, um, how you chose that approach, what kind of data you collected and why you collected that kind of data, uh, and what methods you used for collecting that data. So methods would include everything from the actual data collection tools themselves, to the data collection intervals, uh, to uh, plans for how you're gonna analyze and use that data to answer your research question. Following the method section, there's typically a findings and discussions section. Uh, and again, this section includes just what, the, what it says on, on the tin. Uh, what were the findings of the study? And more importantly, what examples from the study support the things that you found out? Uh, a common way to organize findings <coughs> is by themes or categories that were generated by the data. But another possible way to organize findings is just by chronology. So, for example, you may have a series of short interventions that you introduce and you present the findings based on uh, the sequence that you presented those, uh, uh, those different interventions or teaching strategies. Really important in the findings and discussion section is that you avoid making broad statements or interpretations that extend beyond the participants in your research study, your classroom, or your particular school, unless the nature of, of the research findings make it relevant or make it valid and reliable to do that. What you do do in this section, though, is you include a lot of specific examples. Uh, so, you know, quotes from students, quotes from parents, excerpts from uh, uh, different assessment tools that you've used. You want to make sure that that along with making, uh, along with stating your findings that you produce, uh, you show a lot of uh, supporting statements for the things that you're saying. And the final thing that tends to come out of an action research report are recommendations. So in recommendations, again, you want, we want to remember that the, the data that, or the, the learning that we're generating is specific to the context of our classroom or our setting, that it's not necessarily generalizable to every similar classroom in other schools outside the one that we're working in. Um, so in the recommendations, you want to talk about uh, what sense you're making of the study. You might want to talk about whose interests were served by the research, for example, um, who benefited from the research. Uh, you might think about who else would care about that study. And most importantly in this section, this is where questions that have emerged over the course of doing the study are uh, shared with other people. So this is the point where the next cycle of action research becomes obvious, the questions that emerge from the things that you've done. Uh, part of the recommendations may also include an indication of how you continue to, how you plan to continue the inquiry through or by the investigation uh, of those questions. One of the most important parts of actually creating a write-up of your action research findings is using a critical friend to provide um, feedback. And specifically what you're looking for this person or asking this person to do is to uh, identify potential personal bias that you might bring to interpreting your findings. Again, because you're researching your own practice, uh, it's often difficult to remain or to, to kind of maintain the professional distance that you need in order to make 
uh, kind of objective conclusions based on your data. And so it's really important to have a colleague or someone else look at it and just to challenge you on those kinds of things. Uh, you may use a critical friend, especially if you're producing a written report, just to help you improve the writing of your report. Uh, that person, another person reading your report is, is a really great way to, to think about how accessible is your report to people who haven't been uh, kind of intimately involved in the research that you've been doing. All right, so I, that's just kind of a, a basic introduction to the sections that you might include in, uh, in a, in a write-up about your action research project. In a moment, we're going to um, open everything back up and we're going to ask you to use your paired devices to do some paired discussions around uh, Learning Log 10.1. So again, uh, just as in past sessions, if you want to pull out that Learning Log whenever you have a moment, today our pairings are going to be um, Chantal and Barbara and Stephanie, and then Anjali and Chris. And Chris is with us now, so uh, yep, I see Chris is there. So again, we're gonna give you about five minutes to just rather quickly discuss the way you responded to those prompts in the learning log. And remember what we were asking you to do here is to think about these sections, to look at the, uh, the case study that we looked at the previous week on the effect of technology on enthusiasm for learning science, and to just kind of make some brief statements about how you think the person who wrote up that piece of action research uh, their approach to the introduction, the literature review, the methods, the finding and discussion, uh, the recommendations and implications. So again, we're going to give you about five minutes using your second device to uh, have a quick conversation with uh, the people who are in your groupings. And again, Chantal, Barbara and Stephanie, Anjali and Chris. Uh, if you would, go ahead and get started with that. And again, if you need any help, please uh, write into the chat box. Hi, everybody. Can I, can I just draw you back for one moment, and then I'm going to ask you to do another quick discussion. So if I can have your attention just for a moment, okay. and I want to give you uh, the next task. So in, instead of actually discussing each of those questions now, as we have before, what I would like you to do is to, again, working with the people in, in your discussion team, um, come up with some top tips and suggestions for writing an engaging and informative action research report. So by looking at the case study, by thinking about the different sections and the way that the author handled those different sections, if you were going to give someone some advice in terms of how to write an engaging and effective action research report, what would that advice be? Again, I'm going to give you three minutes to discuss this with your group, and then I'm going to we're going to come back together, and I'm going to ask you to share some of your responses. All right, so if you would, uh, if you would like to just raise your hand and we'll call on you. We do have all the mics open, um, but if you'd like to respond to that question, some top tips or some suggestions you would give for someone else uh, in, in terms of advice you would give for writing an engaging and informative action research report. What are the things that you would look for as a reader that would make it engaging or informative? Barbara or Chantal, go ahead and get us started. I was just, um, you know, last week we kind of, when we looked at this, we kind of bashed her a little bit, you know. And then today when I was, you know, when I was looking at this yesterday, um, I realized that it was actually done in 93, 94. So this at the time was kind of cutting edge technology. So you know, what she was doing was kind of, you know, she got this money, she she, she bought these computers, and I, I kept thinking, I'm sure they didn't have laptops in those days, because she talks about how they would have to put the laptops away, or the computers away, and borrow them from other people, and, you know, and I thought, that couldn't have been that easy, <laughs> you know, it's not like, um, so, it's not really any tips or suggestions for writing an engaging report, but it, it does make you think. Yeah. So, so perhaps times have changed since then. Yeah, but, but perhaps one of the things that makes a, a, a piece um, engaging or informative is when it when it's describing something that is emerging as a new practice. I mean, as, as you said, that that if 
you know, if this would, have, if we would have been reading this in the year that it was published, we may have had a very different response to the action research report. Anyone else? Hi, we've. Okay, uh, Chris, go ahead. We've lost you there. Hi, sorry, everyone was jumping around a little bit. I don't know if the yeah. internet connection's gone a bit funny, and it's just causing everyone to be, we're all just pausing and waiting. Um, if, talk, talking about top just tips and suggestions, Angelie, and is that what we're on? Because I kind of yes. lost it when we were talking. Um, Angelie and I were sort of saying that, um, you know, it needs to be interesting to read, um, and we felt that there was, it, it almost seemed a bit confusing, like the abstract, like the one that we were reading, the abstract was there, but you'd expect it to be just a paragraph, and then it just sort of kind of went into the introduction, and it was explaining the method. Um, I think the, I think we came up, me and Angelie came up with sort of the, the core points, which were um, make sure that the questions that you, you raise are then the ones that you're collecting data about, and then analyze all of the data collected, and, and actually comment on that with relation to the questions raised, because I think... Um, this this report sort of focused in on certain aspects and it, it gave some extra data which then wasn't really analyzed it was just commented on and I think the question you know that the way that the question so so yeah the top tips were be careful with your question selection make sure that you are analyzing the correct the quest the, the data in relation to those questions and feedback that information um, Chris, great. Thank you for that. Um, one of the things that, that, I, that I can kind of add into that, which, which is um, uh, if we would have been actually doing a piece of, of action research as, as part of this course, or when you actually go out and, and do a piece of action research, what you're going to find is, is that point that Chris made about being certain that the questions that you raise in the data collection that you collect are connected to your research question, that becomes that really is, is, is a critical part to every part of this process. It's a, it's a question that you find yourself going back and, and asking and confirming when you're designing your data collection methods. Once you've collected your data, when you're actually analyzing the qualitative data, throughout the entire process, it, it's so important to be certain that what you're doing is actually addressing the research question. Because one of the things that's going to happen is that you, are, you inevitably are going to collect data that is not related to the research question. And oftentimes that data is a result of kind of emerging qualities of the practice that you couldn't have predicted when you designed the research project to begin with. But it's so important to hold those to the side and to use that information to actually frame subsequent cycles of inquiry rather than confusing it or including it in data analysis and in the discussions in the actual research piece. So uh, again, the, the extent to which you can continue to always go back to the research question and be certain that every part of the process is focused on that question makes it much easier than to write a report that has that same level of focus. But again, as I said, always being certain that you kind of log those things that are emerging that don't relate to the question so that you can have those, so those things are the things that inform the next cycle of research. So Chris, thank you very much for that. And Barbara, did you have your hand raised again? Uh, Barbara or Chantal? Oh, this is the first time I've done um, All right, so originally we were just trying to clarify some uh, further research that Barbara did, which brought it back into perspective the era in which this um, piece was written. Um, and it's not as terrible as we sort of made it out to be last week. But indeed, when we actually went through the expectations that you should uh, see covered in each area, it could have been better constructed. So um, we looked at the introductory paragraph, we looked at the literature review, which certainly could have had more uh, data sources, and possibly there was nothing which reflected an, um, an opposing view, which is one of the things that we've been um, kind of uh, suggested is a good thing to include. 
um, methods that the person uses used to collect their data um, were very limited, and we've already established that the question and survey was probably not best served for the purpose. Um, the findings were very broad and um, didn't actually address the question. So there were a lot of things there. So um, the question could have been better constructed to begin the whole process. The review was not very thorough. It needed uh, a little bit more fleshing out and a few more data sources. The data gathering techniques and the survey questions could have been better constructed. And the action research results were not reliable or relevant. Uh, because they didn't address the original question. So there are a couple of things there that could have been improved. Chantal, thank you very much for that. And, and, and that really leads really nicely into kind of the, the, kind of the next uh, section of, of brief content that I wanted to talk about. The quality of the research that you do, the quality of the data collection, the quality of the data analysis, the quality of the literature review, all of those things have a bearing on the extent to which your piece of action research will be uh, appropriate to share in different formats with different people through different publications. And so what I want to talk a little bit about now are, are ways that you might disseminate what you find as a result of doing a piece of action research. And two of the main things that people think of immediately when, we, when you talk about disseminating findings are through publications, or through presentations at conferences. And I want to talk a little bit about each of those. First of all, just as, just as kind of a, a general statement, I want to say that, that whether it's a publication or whether it's a conference, that there will be certain kinds of guidelines that your piece of action research will need to meet in order to be appropriate for sharing through those different uh, uh, channels of, of, of sharing. And, uh, again, it, it comes back to the, what a lot of the things that Chantal was just saying, that, that you could produce um, a piece of action research that maybe doesn't have such a great literature review, but it has a great research question, some da great data collection, but you would be limited then to publishing in those journals for whom the literature review is not uh, a, a, a big part of the uh, kind of the, the, the submission requirement. So again, I, I want to just spend a little bit of time talking about some of the potential ways that you could distribute uh, your learning. And of course, one of, the, one of the most common ways is by sharing what you've done through uh, presentations at conferences. And some of the conferences that these, uh, event, these organizations who host conferences will be familiar to most people. Uh, but these are the types of venues who look, who actually look actively for teachers who've done action research to present what they found at their conferences. So European League for Middle Level Education, uh, ELMLE. Uh, this year, we have two STEM projects that are going to be presenting there. We have our Talking in Class project, uh, as well as our Mission Skills Assessment project, which are presenting, uh, in, in the case of Talking in Class summative findings, in the case of our Mission Skills Assessment, just formative findings. And, and again, one of the things that's important to keep in mind is that you may find that, it's, that there's a real a benefit in presenting formative findings at a conference and getting feedback from a wider group of people in terms of other directions that your research could go. Um, ECIS does both a teacher conference and a school leader conference, and both of those conferences uh, actively look for people who have presentations based on action research. Uh, CIS, the Council of International Schools, uh, and also NAIS, the National Association of Independent Schools, which is a US-based uh, professional association. When it comes to publications, you may look at journals that are uh, specialist journals for certain subjects. So, for example, the Journal for Research in Math Education, the Reading Teacher, Science Scope. There are a whole range of subject specialist journals who publish uh, teacher-led action research. There are some more general journals that publish teacher-led action research in general. Um, and among those are the Educational Action Research uh, uh, journal which is published by Taylor and Francis uh, and published by Rutledge. It's the one there on the left. Um, the Network's online journal for teacher research and some of our uh, case studies have actually come from that online journal for teacher research. 
And as I said earlier, whether you're presenting at a conference or whether you're writing something for publication in a professional journal, there will always be submission guidelines or, or uh, that go along with those. And if I could just focus on this networks, the online journal for action research, uh, as an example, typically most of these have very streamlined, easy to follow procedures because they do take into account that people who, many of the people who are gonna be submitting pieces for this are people who are working full-time as teachers. So in this particular case, um, for the networks, what you do is you create a username and login for yourself. And then once you go into the site, uh, it gives you some very, very brief author guidelines. Um, so again, it gives you options for submitting a full-length article, a short article, a book review, or uh, some information about resources for teacher research. And then within the submission get, uh, guidelines, it actually will give you step-by-step -step directions for how you actually submit something. And these are, you know, th these are the actual submission guidelines for this particular journal. I think oftentimes when we think about these kinds of journals, we think that, it, it, that the amount of work that it would take to get something published um, is so great that we don't actually take the time to pursue it. Um, one of our sim projects, again, the, our talking in class project, which is, has been going on, it's one of our longest running projects, has been going now for over, over three years, uh, has just recently had an article uh, accepted for publication in a peer review journal. Um, and it's been <coughs> published, you can find that on our website. Uh, but again, I, I just wanna emphasize how, how easy that process can be with many of these journals. Now, I also want to talk about some ways of sharing what you've learned through action research that are a little bit outside that norm. Um, and one of those is by organizing the work that you've done in your action research project in an electronic portfolio. Um, and you can share this through, uh, you know, if you have a, a Weebly, if you have your own uh, ways for, for, for sharing this information. Um, this is... Uh, the site from Pepperdine University and Pepperdine is, is the, we saw a number of video clips that were uh, recorded by uh, Pepperdine University as part of their action research course. They require all of their students to create an online action research portfolio as a way of sharing what they've done uh, instead of doing a formal publication or doing a conference presentation. And if you go onto their website, you can actually see examples of what these look like. If we take just a closer look at one of these, what you can see is the researcher has organized their report uh, just using a system of live chapter links. And then within with each of the chapters, when you click it on, it brings up uh, a document that's related to that particular stage of the action research process. And so again, this, this would be a very easy thing to build as an archive as you were going along in your project, rather than something that you would come and try to reconstruct completely after the fact. Another very easy way to share your uh, action research findings is by creating a short video. Uh, in just a moment, we are going to look at a video that was created by our Talking in Class project. And as you listen, one of the things that I'm going to ask you to do is to listen specifically for information that would have been included in a written report in the introduction, in the literature review, in the methods section, in the findings and discussion, and in the recommendations and implications. And I think that one of the things that you'll find is that by creating this very kind of informal narrative that you can present uh, these things in, in a way that seems uh, a, a little bit less cumbersome than actually creating a big written document to record those. So we're going to turn on the video uh, in just a moment here, and we're going to have a listen of this piece from Talking in Class. Hi, I'm Jake Ross. And I'm Brianna Gray. Um, and we're both teachers at ACS International School in the UK. Uh, we recently led an action research project on increasing the quantity and quality of student-to-student -student dialogue in the classroom, and now we're beginning to use those results to train and support uh, other teachers. Well, our research and results have been published in an interactive ebook, um, and that includes a lot of video footage of our work, so that might be the best way to explain our project, um, and starting with an introduction to our project team. When selecting teachers to be members of the project team, we tried to find people who would encompass every grade level and subject area. So we do have teachers who teach grades 5, 6, 7, and 8. We have two math teachers, an IT teacher, a science teacher, and a world cultures teacher on our team. Uh, I'm an EAL teacher. Uh, our student population is made up of more than 50% non-native English speakers, uh, most of whom spend most of their time in mainstream classes. 
So I was interested in increasing the academic language use in those mainstream classes. Um, and my background is in special education and technology. So I've always been interested in differentiation and student-centered learning. Um, and I think we were both interested in using video as a tool for reflection. Well, I came across some research from Stanford and the California public school system that showed increasing structured speaking activities, student-to-student uh, -student dialogue activities, greatly increased uh, student achievement. So we wanted to see how uh, we could apply that to our international school setting. We, we decided to film the process um, so that we could more accurately determine the impact on both the teachers and the students. Uh, so we have a video summary of our methodology. Teachers agreed to attend the one-day workshop and then develop activities based on the FET course skills to use in their classroom. They completed a pre-interview, they implemented the activity and allowed us to come into their classroom and film. They completed a post-interview and they also participated in some of our surveys. From each one of the teachers' classes, we asked a student to participate in the study. The students agreed to do a pre-observation interview where they gave us their thoughts on student-to-student -student dialogue in the classroom. Students were also filmed during the activity. We used the footage of the students to conduct a stimulated recall where students were asked to tell us about what they were thinking during the activity in the hopes that we would be able to learn about the effect of the core skill in the classroom. Yeah, uh, our results fell into four categories. Uh, we discovered that at our school, student-to-student -student dialogue activities increased uh, content understanding, uh, increased academic language use, increased student motivation and engagement, and increased opportunities for assessment. Wait, what's net force? Okay, so remember when Stuart told us last time that you, it's when you push like a book at 50 meters? Maybe we could do 27, and it has to uh, find out and not be a remainder. Yeah, yeah, uh, but, yeah, that would be amazing. Yeah. You said, how do we summarize? What can you elaborate on that last instruction? So it has to be gray to pan, all the shapes. Projects called communicating new schools. This is giving you credit for being able to communicate. When you use one of the words in red, they're bonus words. I'd like you with your whiteboard pen to so just tick it. Don't only, you only need to tick it once. You can get a bonus point for using one of the red words. Was it easier to share your information and share your culture with pictures or writing? How did you divide cookies? So how did you divide cookies? Or how did you divide pizza? Um, well, we've actually started to hold professional development workshops for teachers so that we can share the results and help design student dialogue activities. Um, actually, at our most recent workshop, 87% of the teachers said that it was very likely or definite that they were going to be implementing those activities. So we're really hoping um, that this is going to start to impact student achievement and engagement and really just provide another way to access the curriculum. Uh, so we're looking forward to seeing more school, schools implement uh, the five core academic conversation skills and we've had a lot of interest uh, from schools and teachers to have us come in and do, do the workshop at their school and hopefully add activities to the iBook. And we have a website, um, talkingclass.com, so we're heading to that too. Um, and it's just exciting to see where this will go. Thanks. Thanks. All right, thank you, everybody. I apologize. It seems that uh, some of our uh, colleagues in Doha uh, didn't have such a great connection for that video. But I'm wondering, for the, either for the bits that you were able to see or for other people who were able to see it uh, without problems, if you could just kind of respond to that presentation of action research using the video format, um, using these prompts, I like, I wish, I wonder. And again, if you go ahead and, and raise your hand, I think everyone's mic is open right now, so we don't need to open any mics. Uh, and we can start with either Barbara or Chantal.
So Chantal, it, it seems like what you're saying that one of the things you liked about that presentation is that you you immediately began seeing ways that you could use what you were learning in your own teaching. And again, by actually using video footage where you're seeing live examples of what's happening, um, that, that was certainly their intention with that, with that was actually create something that would create a little bit of excitement to actually have a go at uh, trying some of those, some of those uh, approaches immediately. So thank you for that. Anyone else who well, would like uh, yeah. go ahead? If anyone else would like to respond, can you just raise your hand so we can call on you? Anjali. Yeah, I like the enthusiasm that I'm seeing in the video when, when um, the researcher is talking about, okay, what they, what they did, how they did it, the methods and the results that were being shared. So there's a very positive impact of seeing a video in terms of an array of, um, you know, um, things that are covered. But I wonder, uh, when we talk about recommendations in our literature review or uh, even when, when we have finished our action research, we're thinking about um, some recommendations for teaching and learning. So maybe these were accepts from the videos. So I, I still wonder, how is that going to be fulfilled if I'm showing a video to other people? How would they know what recommendations am I making? Okay. Yeah, no. Angela, thanks for that. I think that I think that certainly you picked up on the fact that when you're when you're writing, um, it, it's hard to actually express enthusiasm in in writing, especially if you're doing professional writing. And there, you know, there is a certain advantage in that kind of face-to-face -face connection that you get with a video and seeing the excitement on on the researchers' faces for the particular topic that they've researched and you know for their for their findings. Uh, great, thanks for that. Let's go to Chris. Um, hi, uh, I yeah, I agree with Anjali. I liked um, it was it seemed much much quicker and easier to relay um, the, the the sort of the main purpose of, of what the project was about, and it was really nice to see all the faces of the people involved and to actually physically see students. I liked the fact that it was a, a bit of a larger su study as well compared to some of the other ones that we looked at. So they looked at a, a broad, you know, it's does this apply in different subjects? Does this apply with different teachers? And quite like that. Um, I wish that there had been um, a bit more concrete evidence rather than just the, the key findings in terms of engagement is increased. Just sort of, you know, we asked or we observed students doing this or we asked students these questions and, and some sort of graphical representation, something that could still flash up quickly but give you, you know, is this really something worth investing thousands of pounds on in of PD or is this just something that yeah the kids were smiling more in that lesson because of the novelty factor again so I, I wish that there'd been more data like that and I do wonder um, you know what, what, what the sort of impact you know proper impact is it just a case of the students made expected progress as they would do with any initiative or, or is is there something sort of more concrete there um, but I did really like the video format I think yeah, it's 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 much quicker at relaying a, a, a vast quantity of information, but it did jump around a lot, and I, I think it did look like a summary to then having to go and read and find the data yourself. It was so, so it was quite a good hook, I suppose, uh, to get you in to get you interested. Chris, thanks, for that. <laughs> and, and, and I think that, that that observation is really a great one. That um, there are certain limitations to using video, especially using that kind of video. Um, that, as you said at the end, that, that it was probably a better hook than it was uh, kind of a, a, a descriptive uh, piece about all the work that took place in the project. 
recognizing that there were real limitations, the project certainly would have gathered a lot more specific data and that they, that data was presented perhaps in, in a slightly superficial way in the video format so that you did still need to go back and look at the, uh, look at the written report in order to kind of get a better idea uh, of, of the effectiveness of those particular teaching strategies. Great, thanks for that. And can we go to Stephanie as well, please? Um, I just have an uh, two I likes. I don't have a wish and I wonder. And I hope it doesn't sound too superficial. I was just thinking that I really liked the title of their project because it just points out the, it's kind of really, really obvious, but you know, you don't necessarily always think of classroom discussions as a strategy to increase or authenticate learning. Yeah, at least I don't with my students all the time, and I really should give that more thought. So I liked that. And then I like the dynamic nature of the video. And um, uh, yeah, and then I had something else, but I can't remember because I had to wait till last. <laughs> <laughs> Stephanie, thanks for that. And, and again, uh, w one of the things I think that you picked up on was, was, how, uh, was, was how this particular team used hooks, and, and not just the hook of the video, but the hook of, of, the, of the title to kind of draw you into uh -huh. The topic and make you really want to know more about that topic. Uh, so uh, again, part part of action research, part part of that dissemination of of what you're what you've learned is is not just sharing uh, information. It is actually creating a sense of the uh, the excitement or the benefit that you experienced as a researcher in undertaking that. And between the video format um, and and even things as you said as as basic as the the name that they gave to their project. Uh, you, you really sensed that this was something creative and innovative that they uh, that they had a lot of fun doing, that they enjoyed doing, um, and that other people enjoyed doing with them. Yeah, I remember what I was going to say. I was going to say that the transfer of knowledge is so much faster with the visual yeah. and so much more kind of all-encompassing. That's what I was going to say, yeah. which you already said. No, again, thank you for that. And, and again, you had a real sense of, is this something I want to learn more about? Or is this something that yeah. isn't relevant to me? It kind of drew you in. And, and, and if it was something relevant, it really kind of sold that really quickly, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, I have to say that that is the kind of all that we brought uh, to session 10. I wonder if you have any questions about this session, oh. about other sessions, about what might come next. If you have any questions or if you'd like to just... Uh, Offer up any comments right now if you'd raise your hand and then we're going to do a few things in closing. So, what are we going to do next Tuesday? Yeah, no, no, that, that's, that's what I want to talk about now. One of the things that we hope that all of you will do as a result of having participated in this course is continue to stay involved in the work that, uh, that SIM is doing and the action research that's happening in your own schools. Just to point out some things that you probably will be aware of and places that you can go to find out more about uh, SIM activities, SIM information. We do have a publication called In-House, which we publish three times a year. Uh, a new edition of In-House has just been emailed to you. So if you've not received your email version of it yesterday, please let us know. Uh, but that, that newsletter has a lot of information about additional upcoming training. It has information about uh, publications that SIM is involved with putting together. Uh, so do take a look at that to kind of have a, have a really good idea of, of kind of things that are happening. As in previous times, we do send posters of upcoming uh, professional development events to the schools, and those should be posted on staff room notice boards. So do continue to watch those notice boards for <clears throat> information about upcoming training opportunities. The SIM website is always a, a good place to look. Uh, the SIM website is really, really active. That We are putting new content up on that website almost every week, and so it does change uh, rather rapidly, and it is, is a rather dynamic way for us to be able to communicate with people. We do have additional explorations, uh, which are these workshops and courses and seminars that we have coming up. Uh, we actually have one of our talking in class uh, workshops coming up. Uh, unfortunately, this next one for talking in class is in Hillingdon, but we are working at getting one out in Doha. Um, and again, uh, you, you can follow us on our Twitter feed. Whenever we go off to events and conferences, we do uh, tweet while we're there so you can have an idea of the kinds of things that we're watching uh, and that we're participating in. So again, I look forward to all of you continue to participate. And certainly one of the biggest ways you can participate is by developing and submitting a proposal for a SIM project. Uh, again, you'll see posted in our explorations that we do have a webinar coming up in February where we'll be talking about how to develop a SIM proposal. 
Uh, the webinar will be live, but it'll also be recorded, so you can look at it anytime if you just want to get some some really quick advice in terms of how to put that together. If you have an idea for a SIM project, now is not too early to begin talking to us. I mean, we are here to help you develop the proposal, not just to collect them and pass them on to the heads of school. So at any point where you think that you have a project, even if you don't think that it's a viable project, you just want to talk about it, um, do kind of send us an email, give us a call and let us know because we are happy to do that. Uh, almost all of our SIM projects that went to the proposal stage last year were things that we'd been working on with people or discussing with people for weeks or months prior to that submission deadline. So again, we're here to help you develop the proposal, not just to kind of pass it around to the people for the approval process once it's done. As in all the sessions, there is a, a final learning log if you'd like to, to use that uh, to record what we've been doing. Uh, but I guess that Latif and I really want to say thank you. This has been an interesting uh, course this time. And in our first pilot of this course, we had 12 people. And it was a completely different kind of course, just in terms of level of participation and level of engagement. So uh, I, I want to thank all of you. This was a very small course, a uh, rather small cohort. There was nowhere to hide, um, even though you were, you were far away. So I want to thank you all for uh, kind of the, the enthusiasm that you brought to the course and for all of your contributions and observations. So uh, thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing you in the future in other SIM events. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I've learned a lot from this. Thank you. One final thing. One final thank thing. You. Before thank I forget, you, thank you. We, we are going to send you a uh, kind of end of course survey. And as soon as you complete that survey, because it's done anonymously, we don't know who's done it. Um, if you could just send us a quick email saying completed the survey and we will send you your course certificate. We do do certificates for all of our courses uh, for you to use in your professional development review. So again, the survey will be sent to you tomorrow morning. As soon as you complete the survey, send us back a quick email just saying that it's done and we will send you your certificate. Thank you all again. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evening and have a great holiday. Wait, wait, wait. 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 Uh, Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so um, I just wanted to say that this was really helpful, and everyone who's going through the slow process, as I am, as an administrator, I'm being evaluated against my slow this year. Um, I'm actually using this process, so it's mm. it's just. It fits so naturally with that, so um, I had to think of um, what is the problem I'm addressing. I had to develop my question. Um, I've got an idea of how I'm going to gather data, and obviously that data will be presented as evidence for my slow at the end of the process. So anyone who's uh, doing slow or is going to be doing slow uh, soon with the strong um, evaluation process, uh, this fits perfectly with both Chantal, thank you for that. And any feedback that you can give to the people who are who are managing that slow pilot group, I, I know that they would really appreciate that. Um, they are aware that we're doing this, and, and part of the intention of this was to build the capacity of people who are participating in that pilot group. Um, we do have a an, another kind of short course, and, and we delivered it in Doha looking at, at student data when I was there in August. And I have to say that, that that we've done that course several times now, and it actually has a completely different title. It's called uh, Collecting and Analyzing Qualitative student, student Data. And we've actually moved more strongly into looking at qualitative data collection and analysis based on some of the same things we talked about in this course in terms of collecting open-ended responses and coding responses and looking at things like engagement and enjoyment. So you know, anything that we can do, other ideas that you have for uh, you know, full-blown courses or short courses that we might do to support that work. Uh, you guys are, are kind of at the front end of that doing that. And when you see that there is, uh, that, that there's some kind of training that you think might benefit other people in your, on your staff, just let us know.